know. Now what do you see? It comes with a little delay, so let me wait. Uh, still says that it's off. Oh, now it's coming. Look at this. That's exactly what we want, right? Exactly what we want. Except exactly that the camera is not so great, but yeah, but that's yeah, your yeah. your part of the line. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> Where should I stand? Because you can see that. Uh, that would be fine because well let me check from the YouTube this is nice so I can check here where you should stand yeah. <laughs> that's perfect just as for this whole thing okay so now guys. finally you know but you guys know that I have developed a reputation of always struggling with my streaming so that happens every single lecture this is not an exception me too so, <laughs> so I yeah. usually have to start 15 minutes in advance of class and then still I'm like ooh, ooh. But you know the reason that I'm doing the reason that I'm streaming my lectures and uh, also uh, you know, Hardly explaining the why the, how is my teaching style that comes of course by from my good friend Aaron Swap. So we've been coaching each other to use this streaming and also trying a little bit of different teaching styles including in-class quizzes I remember in class quizzes came directly from you. You recommended that we I should start using it. And I'm using it now. The streaming we do that. I learned so streaming from you. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, this is how we sharing information. This is kind of our hobby. I mean some people have a more um, exotic hobbies like surfing or soft stuff. So we have lecturing. Yeah, that's and our hobby. <laughs> this yeah. is our hobby. Yeah, now without further ado, so let me introduce uh, Professor Arun Swap. Now, Professor Arun Swap is coming from Delft University of Technology, which is, uh, of course, if you made a list about um, the best universities in Europe and also in you know worldwide, Delft is scoring very high in that list. I don't know what is your ID number. I don't know either. The but it changes depending on the list, but we're pretty high up. Yeah, but there is a few universities between Delft and LUT. Let's put it this way. Exactly. <laughs> LUT and Delft or Delft and LUT. <laughs> Let's not debate on that. Yeah. And now this, I, I promise that take some candies, popcorns, drinks with you because this is going to be better than a movie. In mean, today's lecture, hopefully it's going to be better than a movie. We're going to try. Okay. Yeah, we're going to try. So it's going to be uh, art and science of bicycle, bicycling. Yes. All right. Thank you, Aki, for the, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to always be here to in La Parampa. Thank you for the invitation and uh, thank you for being uh, here at the, at the lecture. Um, so uh, my background is uh, like the same like Aki's. I'm in theoretical and applied mechanics and in particular multi-body dynamics, but uh, you have to apply it to something. And some 15 years ago, I, I had a sabbatical in the US and my host said, hey, you're from Holland. You know about cycling. We have some research in cycling and it has interesting results which are unresolved and can you help us with that? Uh, I never, oh, I, I, I'm in cycling in the sense that I cycle every day back and forth to my, my work and, and I use my bike to, to do shopping and that's a very standard thing in the Netherlands but I never gave it any thought like well what's so mechanically or dynamically interesting on a bike and hopefully after this one hour you, you will share that same interest with me like this is a crazy system, this is interesting. So therefore, art and science of cycling. Um, before we, we look at such a system, I, it's always interesting to do an observation. Eh? You just, just observe, watch what happens. And what you see here is a, a part from a movie called Sur de Fête by Jacques Tati. And, and it's about a postman trying to rationalize in those days and he wanted to do everything fast and on foot. So uh, uh, the American, he wanted to have a bike. And then you see a bike going by itself and then everybody thought, well, this is movies. In the movie, everybody, everything is a trick. So this is a trick too, but, but it's not a trick. Even when it goes around the bend, I mean, there's no uh, trick. It's just a bike uh, and any bike can do this. So, so let's see. Uh, uh, let's wait before we want to see you on the bike is coming back again. Uh, there it is, just by itself. Uh, no, nobody riding it and it's nicely balanced. 
And indeed, if you go to a car park, you take a regular bike, or, and you just propel it forwards, with some given speed, it will stay upright. Uh, and, and this is just an ordinary bike. Uh, almost any bike can do that. Uh, standing still falls over, given some forward speed, it's stable. Well, I always say it's not stable, it's super stable. Because you can hit it sideways, it starts oscillating, and then the oscillation dies out. And then, uh, so that is a very stable system. And, and the big question, of course, is why is that system so stable? Well, that is always the, the, the idea behind it, the question behind it. Now, uh, the bike in itself uh, is, of course, already very old. Uh, here you see a picture of the evolution of the bike. It started in the 1820s, uh, 10 or 20s, with Carl von Draas, who had like a thing called a hobby horse. and. Um, and the thing was, well, you sat on it and you propelled with your feet. Uh, and then somebody discovered, oh, I can, uh, not, I can go faster when I pick, make pedals on my front wheel and then I can pedal. And then somebody thought, well, I can even go faster uh, by making the wheel larger. And then uh, we, we have a, a, an ordinary bicycle, figure seven, with a very large wheel. And then when you want to go faster, uh, there is some physical thing that your legs are not longer and then you cannot make the wheel bigger. So what do you do then? And then somebody said, oh, well, chain drive to the rear wheel. So that's a jump in the evolution. Uh, but it's clearly a jump because you see that the front wheel is still large. And that's an inheritance we got from, from that previous bike. And then in the next, somebody said, well, we don't need that large front wheel. They make a very small one to, 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 to demonstrate their purpose. And then finally, in the 1890s, we have the current bicycle. Eh? If you look outside, that is the bike which is still we are riding. Nothing much changed. So uh, yes, bike is a very old thing, which e evolved to this current design. And already in those days, eh, around the 1890s, mathematicians and dynamicists had the question like, wh why is it that, well, that it's when it's stationary, it falls over? That's clear. It's an unstable configuration, eh, two, two points of contact. But given some forward speed, it seems to be self-stable, stay upright by itself. So what is the reason? So they make a model, and you have to make the model as simple as possible, but not too simple. Eh? So what do we do? Uh, rigid bodies, hands-free operation, idealized contact, no friction or propulsion, eh? a lot of assumptions. And then you end up actually with a system which only has three degrees of freedom. The bike can move back and forth. It can lean left and right, and you can steer. And those, and those three degrees of freedom, that is basically in our system. Uh, note, by the way, that it's an energy conserving system under these conditions. Eh? And then when you look at our experiment in the car park, you saw a damped oscillation. So you think, well, can we describe that with this system? But let's see. So the next step is, of course, uh, you have to make the model. And although it has three degrees of freedom, the thing has 25 parameters, like the wheelbase and the head angle and the trail and the mass. Yeah, the, we have four rigid parts, yeah, two wheels and two frames. And all those parts have mass and mass from our inertia. So 25 bicycle parameters, meaning the whole family of bicycles is very rich. Yeah, you can make all, all kinds of strange bikes if you want. Okay, then what we do, we derive equations of motion. Well, that's your core business also. Yeah, so this, uh, what do you do? You take Newton's law, forces mass times acceleration, you apply it to the multi-degree of freedom system, and in this case you end up with a second order differential equation in the three variables, say, the forward motion, the, the steering and the leaning. Uh, the, the, the leaning is by phi and the steering is by delta and the forward speed is V. And in, for the linearized case where the bike uh, is in the upright configuration, these, these linearized equations are uh, decoupled in that case, eh, forward speed and this, these lateral motions. So we only have to focus at these lateral motions, the leaning and the steering. We get a couple second order differential equation with a mass term, with some sort of damping term, very strange damping if you look into it, and then stiffness, which is partly due to gravitational stiffness, and the other part is due to going into circles, eh, the centrifugal part. Uh, I, I showed also some numbers here, mass matrix nicely uh, uh, positive, definite, and symmetric. This damping matrix, which is linear in the forward speed, um, is a bit off. I mean, it's not symmetric, it's not asymmetric, it's some, some strange form. And of course, a, a symmetric, highly unstable uh, gravitational stiffness, and then some stiffness due to coordinates. 
Then uh, we derive this equation because we want to know the stability of the motion, of the state forward motion, so we assume exponential motions, we get a, a determinant, we get a fourth order polynomial, uh, two second order differential equation, so we get four eigenvalues and eigenmodes. And since the forward speed is an important parameter, we plot those eigenvalues as a function of the forward speed. Here on the right you see the diagram. Then uh, the, the blue lines are the real parts of the eigenvalues and the uh, red part is the imaginary part, uh, the oscillating part. And you see at very low speed that uh, you only have uh, real solutions. Uh, you have two, two numbers A and B plus and the same numbers A and B minus. And that's like with a double pendulum, the unstable motion, uh, the, the plus and the, the A and B. And here they are like 5 and 6.5 or something like that. But when speed increases, you see suddenly two of these roots, they, they come together and, and an oscillatory motion emerges, still unstable, as you can see, but from a certain speed on, all real parts of the eigenvalue are negative, so apparently the thing is stable. So this very simple three degree of freedom model already predicts stable forward motions for a bicycle from a certain speed on. Uh, the question is, uh, oh, uh, how does that look? Well, we take a multi-body dynamic model eh, on the right, and we do low speed, uh, we give it some perturbation, and you see exactly the same thing which happened, uh, uh, which can happen in a car park. If you go too slow, the bike will start oscillating and falls down. And it's also what, you, what happens when you learn how to ride a bike, because riding a bike is dangerous, so you don't go there too fast, and if you don't go so fast, you're unstable, and then you're falling over. I, I think everybody had the experience when we were young. Then, uh, when you uh, uh, speed up the thing a little bit, you get an experiment like this, bike moves forward, <coughs> you hit it sideways, it oscillates and the oscillation dies off. Uh, of course, it remains the question like, yes, the oscillation dies out, so, but it was an energy conservative system, so there's, it's not really damped out the energy, that, that can be the case because energy cannot be lost in this system. So where did the energy then go? Uh, that is one of the interesting questions, of course, um, which I just put in your head, and maybe we'll come back to that. Okay, um, bicycle self-stability. Now, how, how does the bicycle do that? Eh? And I always say self-stability is like automagic control. And, and not uh, automatic, but automagic, because it is like magic. How does that work? So in trying to understand that, um, that is a difficult question. So let's go to a bit simpler question is how do we balance a bike? Because if we have an idea how we do it, then apparently the bike does apparently the same by itself. Uh, again, if I ask you how do you balance a bike, what do you do? Yeah, you move with your body. Is that everything? How do you balance your bike? So, yeah. That's true, but uh, if you are at low speed and you have to balance uh, your riding, the bike, and then you have to balance, so somebody says, yeah, I move my upper body, are there more things you do? Maybe by balancing the weight of the body and the bicycle. Yeah, so that was the upper body thing, right, this. Uh, steering assembly, do you use that for balance maybe? Or it's not necessary? I raised the question because initially you would think, oh, we know how to do that. But actually, we have no clue how we balance the bike. <laughs> right? I mean, people say upper body, other steer. and uh, So let's go to an even simpler problem. And that is if you have a stick on your hand and you want to balance that. How do you do that? Well. Unfortunately, I don't have the real stick, but let's use this one. So this is the stick. Now, if I want to balance this, if it's falling in this way, I quickly move my hand underneath. And if it's falling in that direction, I quickly. That is the way how I balance something on my upper hand. And in that sense, the bike is exactly the same. Um, now, in the bike case, I cannot move uh, the, the support because then I have to move earth. And that, is, that takes a lot of people to do. Um, but in a moving bike, I have handlebars. 
And in a moving bike, when I steer to the left, my contact points go to the left. And in a moving bike, when I steer to the right, my contact points go to the right. So via my steering assembly, I have a way to move my contact points in a moving bike. And that is actually the whole way how I balance my bike. So bear with me, if I fall to the left, I have to steer to the left to get up right again. And that seems a bit counterintuitive because you would think, oh, I fall and I steer in that direction. Well, then it only gets worse. And that is probably also the reason why it's not so easy to ride a bike in the beginning. You have to learn it. It's an acquired skill. You cannot buy a bike with a book and say, oh, mount a bike. Yeah, okay, I'll do that. They start pedaling. Oh, I start pedaling. That's good. Oh, if you fall to the left and you steer to the left. What the hell? It's an acquired skill, right? But that's the way to go. And it also explains very clearly that at very low speed, it's hard to balance because that effect of that steering is not so high at low speed that the contact points then don't move so quickly sideways. Okay, is that really the way how we balance? And then here comes an anecdote. We have students, they do projects. Lego Mindstorms is a cool stuff. You have sensors, motors, and controllers. and Usually they build a robot. He was a motorcycle guy, this Hugh, and he built a motorbike. Now you have two, uh, two frames, you have two motors, one for the steering, one for the propulsion. You have a sensor measuring the thing falling over, and you have a controller. And Hugh was very good at motorcycle riding, so he thought, I know how to balance. Well, whatever he put in the controller, the thing always fell over. He used angles, angular rates, uh, steering, torques, whatever. It didn't work. Uh, he wanted to go to his internship in Switzerland and then he became nervous and he said, well, some students said, well, you should go to Schwab, he has a lab somewhere there and he knows about bicycles and pedals. So I said, well, you, uh, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, the only thing you have to do is you have to steer into the fall. So uh, you know how, uh, that you're falling because you know what the lean rate of the bike is. And you can steer because you have a DC motor and you apply a certain voltage and that's the amount of torque you apply, so that's the amount of steering. So my control law would be the steer motor voltage is some constant, 8 times the lean rate or 80 or minus 8 or minus 80, you have to fiddle, eh? you have to find out the correct signs and then uh, with the order of magnitude, but that should work. And then you, he was sort of silent looking at me. I said, yes, you, what's the problem? He said, well, it's only one line of code in my controller. I said, yes. So he just went away. And then he came back, yeah, I think, well, it took him five minutes or something like that with this video. And this clearly shows that you just have to steer into the undesired fall and then the thing stays upright. This is the living proof. Okay, uh, if we look now at the real bike, we see the same phenomena. It's falling to the left, and then it's steering to the left, and it's falling to the right, and then it's steering to the left. So it's doing that. So we're happy with that. Then the next question is, of course, why is it doing that? Because we have discovered how you must balance, then we have seen that it really happens in the bike. But now what is the deeper, uh, the magic behind this? What is the deeper thing? Which, which contraption makes sure that if you fall to the left, it's really steering to the left and it's steering the right amount at the right time. So there are two things. Um, then you look into literature and everybody says, well, that's super clear. It's the gyroscopic effect of the front wheel. And what is that? Well, they say this, this front wheel that is a rotating thing and a spinning disc is a gyro and a gyro, then you get all kind of quirky things. If you have a gyro and a spinning about this axis and it's doing like this, then uh, it's also moving like that. It's a strange 3D motion. So it's spinning in one direction, then you rotate it in the second one and then you get a torque about a third. So it's one, two, three. It's a three dimensional thing. Uh, and then if you check the signs, it's correct. Uh, for a wheel rotating in the, uh, going forward in this direction and the bike falling over in the left direction and you really get a torque which steers into uh, although the numbers are small, you, well, maybe that's the thing. No, say people, that's too small. That can't be the real thing. Um, the magic is in the geometry of the steering assembly, and that's on the right. 
And the, the buzzword there is trail, and trail being how far is the contact point behind the steering axis. So you see in e the, the steering axis be elong elongated, it touches the ground, and then the contact point is a certain distance behind that, that, that uh, steering axis. Just like, well, just like in this, these wheels on, the, on these chairs, like uh, these caster wheels, they, they also have the contact point uh, behind the steering axis. And, and that makes that the whole thing, yeah, this, this, this caster wheel by this positive trail follows the, everything and stabilizes it. Uh, so we have two, two groups. The first group about the gyroscopic effect is already pretty old. Uh, these are two, I, I will say, half gods. They live uh, up there somewhere. That's Klein and Sommerfeld. Uh, Klein, famous for the Klein bottle, Sommerfeld, nominated 81 times for the Nobel Prize. Said this is a l different league of researchers. Uh, Fritz Neuter was their companion. And they, they wrote a book on, um, that's German, eh, on uh, the theory of gyros. And uh, it's a four volume work. So if you look at uh, the books there, they're about this size. And so the four volumes in total take up this, this space in your, on your shelf approximately. And then volume four uh, has a lot of applications. And, and, and of course, if you're in gyros, you see gyros everywhere. And they also saw a gyro in a bike. Like, oh yeah, that's also a gyro. And uh, yeah, the gyro stabilizes there. So they went into the trouble to uh, to write about that, and they said, whoa, they knew the literature, they knew the, the, all the publications, they said, whoa, that must be the effect. And I will de we will demonstrate here that uh, this gyro is really responsible for its stabilization, and it's essentially, actually. Then they derive equations of motion and uh, linearize them, and they pull out these gyro strings. Uh, unfortunately, they make two sign errors in their derivation, and then their whole case of well, we, when we drop the gyro term, the thing is unstable, it's unclear then. So uh, they didn't check their work properly, and, and the result, therefore, is, a, is a not true. So it, it, it's not the case that if you drop the gyro, it's always unstable. So that's one theory debunked. And the second one is, oh, uh, no, if it's not si si uh, gyro, then it's trail. So. Uh, David Jones from the 1970s, who was from uh, Cambridge, I think he had a PhD in chemistry, but he was interested, yeah, in not so much in the stability of the bike, but more, uh, why, why is it so easy to ride a bike at a certain speed? So it's very close related, of course, to the stability. And he was totally focused on this trail thing. And then, well, first he knew his classics too. So in the top you see a picture and he has killed the gyroscopic effect by mounting next to the wheel, a little bit up, a counter-rotating wheel, so that the net angular momentum is zero. And then, you, as you can see, oh, mommy, I can ride without hands. So, uh, demonstrating that gyro is not so important for this, this balancing thing. But then, on the bottom, you see two pictures where he tinkered with this trail, and so on the right picture, he made the trail uh, negative, and he said, I cannot ride that one without hands, and even with hands, it takes a lot of control. And the one with the positive trail, with the larger trails on the left, was a lot easier to ride. Then he goes into the whole theory, which is based on potential energy, to show that trail is, a dom is the necessary thing, positive trail. But, uh, well, the negative thing is that uh, it's based on potential energy, and potential energy is not about moving systems, it's about stationary systems. And if we correct about that stationary thing by a dynamic uh, coefficient, then again, it's not clear that trail is the important necessary factor for self-stability. Remains, of course, the question, what is the thing which makes that self-stability? So I if it's not gyro, if it's not trail, what is it? Well, if you look at the equations, we've seen you, those are two second-order differential equations with uh, these four matrices, and every matrix has four entries. Well, some have some zeros, but on average, three and a half entries. And then these entries in itself are expressions of our 25 bicycle parameters in the matrices. Then with these entries, we have to form a characteristic equation, which in itself is a function of, of the coefficients of these matrices. So if you want to see what the effect is in initially on the stability criteria, which are 
uh, these six real Hurwitz criteria that all these coefficients must be zero uh, positive, then you can fill all the rooms of the whole engineering department here at La Paranta University with the expressions. That's undoable. That, and, and it's unsolvable, actually, that whole problem, mathematically. So we're stuck. Um, so what do we do? Well, then we go to a simpler case. We say, let's make a bike when there's no gyro. So it's on skates, eh? theoretically on skates. Uh, let's make sure that the contact point is exactly in line with the steering axle. So there is no trail. So no gyro, no trail. And then let's see, show that this thing is self-stable. Then we clearly have explained that, not, that neither gyro nor trail is necessary for this stability. So this is the theoretical basis. It's got only eight parameters now. So it's a lot simpler analysis. And then you can put it almost on one page to stitch through all the different uh, Ruth Hurwitz criteria to come to the conclusion, oh, for this set of parameters, the thing is self-stable. And it ends up in something like this, that you say, well, the mass of this front assembly has to be in the shaded region. If it's there, conditionally or unconditionally, then you can <coughs> have a system on the, uh, like shown on the right, where all the eigenvalues from a certain point on are all uh, negative and the thing is self-stable. So that's a nice theoretical result. Of course, the proof of the pudding is to eat, so we have to make that bike. Well, before we do that, we simulate it in a multi-body dynamic environment, and we see it's not about small numbers. And you, you could think, oh, it's about small perturbations. If I really hit it sideways, it immediately falls over. That's not the case. Eh? The simulation also tells us, well, you can just hit it with a reasonable amount sideways, Let's run it again. So it's going at a forward speed. Uh, I, well, it's not really, well, whatever. Uh, I hit it sideways and it's, and it's not falling over. So we made the thing. Of course, with two point masses, it's a bit more difficult. And, and all the details about, you want to have low friction. So you make small bearings. Um, you have to make sure that the contact between the, the road and the wheel is idealized and you cannot use tires. You have to kill the gyroscopic effect, so we have a small wheel on top of the, the, the ground wheel. But in the end, we were able to make a, a bike like that, a little bit scaled down. Uh, usually a bike is one meter wheelbase, it's three and a quarter now. Two point masses of two kilograms, so it's all manageable now to do experiments. It's 99.5% gyro free, that's not completely, uh, but that's, that's reasonably well. And it has a, a little bit negative trail, and we did that on purpose, because in reality, the contact with the ground is not, not, uh, never a point contact. It's always a finite region. And if we estimate that the, the contact patch is within this, this five millimeter, and we make a trail which is minus five, we're really sure that the net lateral force is not uh, uh, having a positive trail. Okay, that having said, uh, we can then measure the thing and then compare uh, the measured I of the eigenvalues from the, the measured parameters with the theoretical one. Still tells us it should be self-stable. So then we build the thing, we go to the gym, we launch it and we release it and hopefully it will stay upright and indeed nicely stays upright. Moreover, we can launch it <coughs> again and then we can hit it sideways and then it should stay upright. And yeah, it nicely, it oscillates a little bit and it comes back up again. Well, this was uh, the topic of our publication in 2011 in Science on uh, the, the, a bicycle can be self-stable without gyro and caster. Remains, of course, the question, why, why is this bicycle self-stable? Well, it has to steer into the fall. We, uh, we all agree on that. But then the question is, how does it do that? Well, looking back at the machine, if this is the machine, then uh, so if the the front the, the the rear frame, which is the dark one with the mass MB, if that one is falling over, then apparently uh, the steering is also in that direction, and that's clear because for the the gray the front assembly the steering is in front of the steering axis, so it's highly unstable. The the moment the thing starts leaning, it will immediately steer into that direction. So that, and apparently for this mass distribution. 
that works. So the idea is that the, due to the mass distribution, you have this steer into the fall effect. So that's another way of making it self-stable. Okay, so now we looked at this bike, this uh, uh, all of the, the wheels assembly, the, all the iron stuff, but it's actually far more interesting to go to a question like, what do wheels do on a bike? And the basic question like, how do we control a bike? How do we balance and control? How we, do we maneuver? Uh, why does one bike feel so much different than another bike? I don't know if you have the experience, but usually you have your own bike, you're used to that, and then you ride another bike, and then you have to do some system identification to understand that this one is operating a little bit different. And if you don't do that, then in a panic situation, your reaction will probably be wrong, and you will crash. So there's a lot going on in this combination of rider and bike. So we are super interested in rider control and handling. So how do we control the mostly unstable bike? Why do I say mostly unstable? Because you do a lot at low speed, starting and stopping you do at low speed. That's also where a lot of accidents happen. Um, and then the answer is, of course, by steer and balance. But how do we do that? Well, you see two persons here. One is very famous. You recognize her immediately. That is my daughter when she was young. I, she was my study object, of course, on how do you learn to ride a bike, right? Um, question. To turn right on your bike, what do you do? Well, you you stick out your hand, of course, right? Let's, <laughs> let's forget about that. How do you make a corner to the right? By turning the steering to the left. No, I want to go to the right, not to the left. Yeah, sorry. That's a, that <laughs> sounds like a stupid idea. <laughs> Any ideas? What do you do? Lean towards the right steer. Lean towards the right steer to the right. Yeah, that's what you do. Okay. Any ideas uh, in the back? Steer to the right. Steer to the right. Yeah. Well, it turns out that this jet command is right. You have to steer to the left. There's only one way to go to the right, and that's steer to the left. And 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 it was uh, what? Steer to, yeah, you have to steer to the left and then let go of the handlebars. And why is that? Well, to get into a corner, the whole thing has to lean, and. You have nothing to push against on a bike. I mean, if you lean left, the bike goes right, leans right. And if you lean right, the bike goes left. So you can do this, but for the net system, nothing happens. You, you cannot push against something. So how do we get ourselves in this unbalanced state? Because we want to go like this around the corner. Otherwise, we fall out of the corner. So to go right, we have to lean the bike to the right. Well, I know a mechanism to lean our bike with our steering assembly. So we go straight, I want to lean my bike to the right, then I steer a little bit to the left and I immediately fall over to the right and I get into this curve. So here I have a video of that, that process. I move forward, I steer to the left, the bike falls over to the right. Well, this goes a bit too quick, of course, so let's do a slow motion one. Um, so the bike moves forward and from now on I have a small torque steering to the left, you see the bike of course falls over to the right because my contact points go to the left. You get nicely in the corner. You don't have to bother about the steering assembly. It goes by itself. You get out of the corner. Uh, you can do the experiment at home very nicely. Uh, cycle and don't hold the standing handlebars like that, but just with your open hands and push slightly against the handlebars. And then you ride straight and you push slightly with your right hand, you will feel uh, the bike will fall over to the Right, and if you push like this, steer to the left, will fall over to this. So, please try try to do it at home. That's really cool. Or oh, at home on the road. Uh, okay, back to the question: How do we do that? Eh? How do we steer and balance? The research on bicycle control and handling is um, yeah quite recent actually. It started in the 70s, uh, uh, partly at Delft on bicycles and on the other part in, in America on motorcycles and both actually driven by safety. The first was, uh, or the second was uh, 
the problem in the US, a lot of motorcycle riders were crashing and getting into serious accidents. And the question was, is maybe this vehicle, the motorcycle, is inherently unsafe and we should ban it from our roads? Yeah, the, that's a real American approach, like, oh, it's unsafe, it's not allowed anymore. Um, so that was David's Weir uh, analysis, looking into uh, the rider control and effectiveness. And then at Delft in the 70s, the question was, how safe it is uh, to be intoxicated by drugs, marijuana, or alcohol, vodka, uh, to ride a bike. Well, the ethical committee didn't uh, comply with uh, having people intoxicated riding a bike, so that was out of the question. So they built a thing called a sort of a bicycle simulator, and then they just measured their response, and from that they identified these uh, control uh, laws eh, or these transfer functions which get show a gain and a delay and based on the gain and the delay they decided oh yeah uh, people are doing a bad job here they have a large delay or they, they increase their gain you know, so. um, it was not so hard to find volunteers for this they were like queuing up in the alley because everybody wanted to uh, smoke for free marijuana or drink alcohol so it was memory research and the result of course was um, yes it is dangerous to ride a bike, intoxicated, yeah. And after that, nothing much happened, actually. Nobody was really interested. Now, we were still interested <coughs> in riding control and handling, especially handling. So what do we do? Again, observations. We build a bike with the cameras and sensors. And the first thing we did was just ride around town, just some parkour in, in, in the city. And this is then the result. The camera is mounted on the rear frame, so you see all the relative motions of the rider with respect to the bike. Of course, you also see the world moving, and you also see a lot of interference. So this is not the ideal way to do experiments. So you have so many perturbations from the outside. So we decided, let's go inside. So we went to a, a large treadmill at the Free University in Amsterdam. It's a three by five meter surface has a max speed of 55 kilometers per hour. You can even tilt the thing a little bit up and down. We didn't use that. And then on that one, we c you can ride. Well, the big question is, of course, can you ride on a treadmill? How does that feel? And then the answer is, uh, well, to me, like an old person, yeah, it feels very strange. To ride a bike on a treadmill is like, oh, I cannot do that. Now, what is the problem? Of course, I'm old and I'm clumsy and so on, but I sort of know how to ride a bike. So what is going on here? One of the sensors is really telling you you're not moving, and that's your eyes. And your eyes are very, very good sensors, very powerful sensors. So my eyes tell me the environment is standing still, there's nothing moving. But me pedaling on the bike and steering is telling me, oh, you're moving. And looking at the belt, oh, I'm moving. But the rest, tell, oh, you're not moving. And this conflict uh, yeah, results in that you stiffen up and then voila, you finally can. So there are a number of tricks. You can look into infinity while you're cycling. Just trust, I can cycling and that works. You can generate optical flow with the screen or wind or look at your front wheel, which is rotating. Those things help. And then, in the end, you can easily ride it. Here you see an experiment. There's a, a the, the, the cord is a tether for safety, so there's nothing. I'm, I'm with a harness in case I fall. And here I, we just looked at, how, how, have we measured and looked? Uh, how, how do we do that? So we have sensors to measure uh, steering and rolling and so. But one thing which is very clear from the data and also from the video is when the speed becomes lower, you steer a lot more. And I was expecting, like you say in your audience, oh, you start moving with your upper body. Well, if you look at the video, this guy is not moving his upper body. It stays within the plane of the bike. And, I, and, and you would say, oh, this is a very stiff guy. Well, I know, for, I know this guy, and I know that it's not stiff what he's doing. I was very relaxed, very relaxed pedaling. And even at low speed, the only thing which I do Besides steering, is with my knees, I go with my legs in and out, but not with my upper body. And that was a very deep insight we had. Before that, we didn't know. But now we know, oh yeah, balancing is done, not with the upper body, but with steering and knees. And for the rest, no. Okay, um, this was uh, video data and sensors on the bike. 
We wanted to know more, so what we do is we, we equip somebody with uh, all these active sensors which have a high refresh rate, very accurate, have one millimeter spatial, all three directions. Um, and then when you do a run, you get enormous amount of data and you have to compress that data. So we use a thing called principal component analysis to compress that and find out what are the major motions and what are the minor motions. Uh, we can reconstruct all the data. That's so nice eh, when you do all this nice uh, uh, accurate measurement. So left is writing, uh, right is uh, reconstruction. And then the, this is a sketch of all the different motions eh, from the major to the minor. So the major motion uh, turned out to be the bike itself and not the guy pedaling on it. And then and the nice thing you see, the steering and the leaning is coupled. Eh? The second one is just the whole assembly having a yaw motion. Then uh, <coughs> the third one is paddling, of course, and uh, then the fourth one uh, is, uh, well, you bend your spine because you have to paddle, so there's some spine bending going on, uh, some upper body sway. Uh, you also see knees moving in and out, and there's a, like a secondary. And it also depends, knee motion, a little bit on speed. So the knee motion was clearly a low speed one, and the other ones were. But that, that told us that, um, oh, and here you see difference between different speeds, but that told us that in this control system, you have a lot of sensors for input, eyes, ears, every haptic, whatever, but the output organ is very simple. That's your steer. So your steer torque or steer angle, whatever, that's your output system for your control. That made it a lot easier. So uh, it's not a, a multi-input, multi-output, it's no MIMO, but it's a multi-input and a single output thing. Eh? It's a meso, so that, that makes it a bit more simple. Okay, uh, now you would say that's all very nice, this bicycle research, but uh, what good is it? Or in other words, what is the relevance to society? Eh? What can we do with this? And the relevance to society is that we see in accidents that um, and this is seriously injured, but uh, the same holds for deaths in traffic, that with cars and other modes of transport, that's going down. Every year, uh, the number of seriously injured is going down. But in cycling, it's going up every year. Uh, that's an exposure problem also, because more people uh, cycle, because people are getting older and staying longer on a bike. But besides that, it's a, it's a wrong message. It's a wrong message when more people die in traffic. So, um, and when you look at the details of this, then it's usually elderly people, and it's usually not that they get run over by a bus or a truck, they just fall over. And in that falling over, of course, the stability of the bicycle is an important thing, so can we, can we assist them in that? So we came up with an active lateral stability control. Uh, we call it steer assist. It's like a smart bike. And what does it do? Well, it helps you in, in the balancing of the bike. Because in essence, as we have seen with the Lego Mindstock bike, you can make a bike which is which does a stabilizing itself. So it senses it's falling over and then it's steering in that direction. So we built such a system on a new on a real bike. So uh, besides the, the, the human controller, you also have a, just a steering to the fall controller, and they both have shared control eh, because you can both hold on to the handlebars, and then you can balance the bike. That is the whole idea. The big question is, of course, how does that feel? Because then there's some somebody is tinkering with your steering assembly. So uh, how, do you like that? Or do you, oh, uh, something weird is going on. What is this? We built the thing together with the Gazelle and Porsche company. And, uh, and this is a prototype, a bit clumsy and so on. But people tend to like it. It, so, it sort of works. 50% uh, says, yeah, this is very nice. And then the other 50% says, oh, a horrible bike. It's doing all kinds of strange things. Well, yeah, that was the purpose, actually. But so the, 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 the human acceptance side, we're, we're still working on that. And of course, the miniaturization of everything. But it's one of the nice applications in this balance uh, stuff. Uh, and, and it really works when we measure, uh, on the one hand, the human controller versus the shared controlling. We see... Uh, human controller is doing a lot of steering at low speed, power spectral density is very high, and in the shared control it's a lot lower, he's doing a lot less, the uh, system is a lot quieter and easier. So that's one of the things, and then uh, on top of that of course the bike lab is doing an, a 
whole number of other projects. Well, I want to share just a few results on that. Um, well, one of the things is um, I'm, I'm, I'm very much interested in, buy, in, in building a good bicycle simulator. So we have a bicycle simulator where, uh, where the, the forces on the handlebars, the haptic feedback is very realistic, it's model driven, uh, good uh, head mount display with a 360 vision. Um, the, the base is not tilting, so uh, this is, I always say this is the simulator with a bucket because you have conflict of sensors and you tend to get sick on this one. So we still need a moving platform on this. But then, then, then we can make a system where you can evaluate how, uh, how people uh, ride, are they still able to ride, can we learn them to ride, can we assist them. So that has many opportunities. Then within the <coughs> consumer industry, there's a thing called shimmy. On the left, you see a, a sudden wild vibration of the handlebars. I haven't seen racing bikes, but nowadays also in uh, consumer bikes because they have a step through frame, it's a bit more flexible. Uh, the e-bikes go a little bit faster. Uh, you don't have to hold on to the handlebar so tight. And um, well, this is of course being very dangerous. We make models who can predict that and now the manufacturer build bikes which do not have that. And the other thing is in sports engineering, uh, we work together with uh, Tour de France elite teams and questions like, uh, why is one so good at descending and uh, opposed to another one? Uh, can you learn a bad descender to become a good descender? And again, that starts with observations, with measuring, and then building a system with augmented reality in glasses, preferably, <coughs> like Toby glasses, or where you can project the idealized uh, line of the road in the glasses uh, so that it can stay looking at the road while descending. He gets information on braking, uh, et cetera. So that's an ongoing thing. Um, what more? Oh yeah, uh, uh, this year is uh, Olympic Games in Tokyo and the track cycling team wants new bikes. And then you say, why do you want new bikes? They say, uh, because we want new bikes. It's totally unclear why they want new bikes, but they want new bikes. And maybe it's also for Moran. <coughs> uh, then a whole team was formed with a Colga, the manufacturer, to use that for the dynamic frame control, Pontus for engineering, and ActiFlow for the, the design of the idealized uh, flow on the bike and uh, reducing the resistance. Multidisciplinary team. Um, we discovered that the current bikes are too small. All current bikes were too small. If you look at the picture, you see this guy or this girl is with her knee hitting her elbow. And the same was for this guy. This is even more extreme. Uh, of course, you would say, well, then uh, th this is because all these Dutch guys are so large. Uh, you should select smaller guys, right? Well, we said, why don't we make the bike fit the rider? So that was our purpose. Two things. We wanted to fit the rider on the bike. And we wanted to make sure that in this new, for this new bike, you had the optimal position to deliver power and you had the optimal position for the air drag. So the active flow people told us, well, this should be the posture. And then we went to the bike fitting and we fitted all the way to get them in that posture and see if that's the max power and change things all within the rules of the UIC. The rule book is like this because you cannot build a bike where handling <coughs> bars are too far away and it, the rules are horrible. But anyway, we finally came to, uh, to build for every individual rider, uh, these are the girls, um, a bike. And on the top you see uh, uh, the... the the case of one of the initial bikes uh, of one of the riders and the fun was that about handling and control she had two bikes she had a Koga and she had a look and she said well the the Koga bike is very nervous when I'm in the corners and I try to accelerate it's very nervous I go all over the place whereas my look bicycle is pretty st stable though now what we we took the whole contraption and we calculated the thing which you see on the right is called dynamic stiffness so that the steering assembly stiffness as a function of forward speed but also of uh, steering frequency so it's like <coughs> transfer function <coughs> and we showed yeah indeed it, your bike is like that so with that whole idea of dynamic steer stiffness we now can design a bike with a desired handling characteristic and we did that actually for all the team members and then finally the bike was launched and if I remember well already some European championships were worn with these new bikes. 
I think this ends my <coughs> presentation. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk a little bit about our research, uh, humble research on bicycles at the UDL. If there are any questions, feel free. Anybody? Uh, if it's good, I have recorded everything so that I think Aki will make that available because I, I, I heard that you will get questions again on this for an exam or whatever. I don't know how that works, but uh, okay. If there are no questions, then I'll stop the whole thing in the recording. Thank you.